Good morning. Welcome to Westview Baptist Church. Hi, my name is Rick Bowling. I'm the pastor at Westview, and we are so glad you decided to join us today. Today, we're going to be talking about something really near and dear to my heart. It's an outlook on life, and I call it a win-win. Uh, the title of the message today is A Win-Win to Live as Christ and to Die as Gain. We're going to be in the book of Philippians, uh, chapter 1. We'll get into that in just a minute, but I want to welcome you once again today. I also want to give you the opportunity to um, support the ministries here at Westview. If you'd like to do so, you may go online to wbcshelby.org, and you can give online there. We certainly thank you for their, your kind gifts ahead of time. Oh, also, you can give through our Westview Baptist Church Venmo account. Thanks again. Okay, well, let's jump in. You know, it's interesting because Paul wrote this letter, uh, I think, around 60 A.D., and it was a uh, from a he was from a Roman prison cell at the time, and uh, Paul wrote it uh, to the Philippians, the Philippian church, and it's pretty much predicated, uh, predicate, excuse me, predicated uh, on goodwill, uh, you know, of the sharing the gospel and what that looks like. Some of the themes are the participation and partnership of furthering the gospel. Um, it's about, uh, you know, you hear the, the language of Paul's heart, the deep affection he has there for the church and the people he's writing to. Um, also, we'll see what's taking place while he's in prison. Um, there's some themes of suffering. There's uh, about prayer. And so uh, there's a few other things, but uh, certainly those are the, the crust of it. And um, here's Philippi is now this... This urban political center, center it was of uh, basically Roman and uh, Greek people. Uh, they used uh, quite a bit because it was an urban city of the Greek um, uh, mathematical system, you know, from the culture there. And uh, one of the interesting things that we that we see with this and looking and doing some research, there was three specific women that are mentioned um, in the book of Acts 16. We see Lydia. Um, she was a businesswoman, and some of, she and some of her Jewish friends, they were um, uh, having their Sabbath when Paul comes up, and then he shares the gospel, and and uh, she invites them to her household, and, and everyone there is, is saved and baptized, and we be, believe that's probably the beginning of the first house church there. Uh, there's a couple other ladies in, in Philippians 4 that Paul mentions. Uh, about Judea and Syntac and, he, and he's speaking to them and so this is a part of the church and so it, it's interesting to see that um, because that's just a little bit about the uh, context that we're speaking in the church is starting to grow um, and uh, and so it was it was a big deal Paul's trying to make sure that they're in one accord and uh, and, and you know why are you doing the things you're doing but more than anything is that the message of Christ is being preached. And, you know, uh, it's interesting when I think about these women, I was listening to a, uh, it's a video by Francis, I mean by um, Lee Strobel called The Case for Heaven. And we talk about to live as Christ and to die as gain. And uh, it, it had a lot to do with, with that. When I think about that, Francis Chen, um, he's a pastor, a missionary, uh, has written many books, uh, a teacher, speaker, and um, he was, in this video, he was talking about how his mom passed away while, with during his childbirth, and so he never knew his mother, um, and evidently had a difficult time, his dad blamed him, and uh, it was a pretty difficult childhood, but you know, he was reflecting about that and about death, and he said, you know, I didn't really know my mom, um, and so he says, I, you know, I often wonder what would it be like? What was she like? But in the midst of this journey, he talks about when he goes back to China and starts a, a ministry there. And he says, lo and behold, he finds out he is in the same place where his mother began her ministry. And so she was a minister. And he said he just couldn't believe it. And, and it, you know, it was a God moment. And he says, you know, um, one day I know I'm going to meet her. And, uh, but right now it's best that I carry on, you know, the ministry that God has called me to just like she did. And so today we're going to see what Paul, how he addresses that and what that means. So if you have your Bibles, if you'll turn over into 
Philippians 1, and we're going to start with verse 12. Uh, the, this, this first passage, um, well, I, let's just read it. It's uh, verses 12 through 14. Paul says it this way. He says, Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. Man, what an outlook he has. He says, As a result, it has become clear through the whole palace guard and everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and the sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. And so here is Paul, and this first section, uh, I titled it, My Cut Runs Over. You know, I think of uh, the 23rd Psalm, incredible psalm. And, you know, it's uh, the Lord is my shepherd. You know, I lack nothing. Uh, it's all about this perspective of this relationship with God. And, and he goes on and he says, uh, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. And, and even he talks about that. He says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. He says, for Lord, you're with me. Your rod and your stad come from me. And he goes on, he says, and, and you even um, prepare a place at the table of my enemies. And then he says this, he says, you anoint my head with oil, my cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And so, you know, his cup runs over. In the midst of this, that's what David is saying. And, and so we see here, in essence, this is what Paul's looking at when he's in prison. And he's like, Lord, you had a purpose. You had a purpose for sending me here. It ha this happened so I could actually advance the gospel. And, and I think verse 12, when we see that, you know, we can see that, that Paul is so passionate about what he's doing. And I think that's a, one of the first things we'd, we'd say about that verse and ask ourselves is, what is your lifelong passion? What at the core of who you are? And we're not talking about your job, what you do, and about your career. But what is it within you? And I can tell you that God has a plan. He has a plan for, for us. And, um, I mean, you know, the thing that we see, there's uh, Paul wrote to the Galatians, and there was many things that, that he wrote about. And I think one of the first things that, that we might want to look at here uh, is Galatians 4. And he, and he says it this way. Uh, it's in 4, 4 through 6. He says, But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. He says, Because you're his sons, God sent the spirit of son into our hearts. The spirit, he says, who calls out Abba, Father. And so I think one of the things that, that it's important for us to see is that that we're, we're God's designed to be his children. I preached a few, <clears throat> a few weeks ago, and this whole idea about us being family, it was from uh, Hebrews, and this idea we are adopted as, as uh, son, brothers and sisters and sons and daughters of Christ. And, and so, first of all, you need to know that that's the ultimate plan that God has for us, is that we are to become his children. Um, and, and he gives us that, that choice. And even that, that, in, uh, that idea of talking about Abba, Father, Romans 8, uh, we see over in 829, uh, he says that, this way, For those that God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And so, again, you know, that's our end goal is that we're going to be conformed to the image of, God, uh, of the Son. And here we are, and here we're on this earth. And our purpose is certainly to, to, uh, to glorify the Lord. And, and so when we begin to see that God loves us enough to make his, us his children, and we know he, he went all the way to the cross to do that, oh, my goodness. I mean, I... I want to tell others about that. I want them to know that. 
And so first things first, we see that Paul realizes um, that no matter where he is, uh, you know, this evangelism, if you want to use that word, that's his, that was his meat and potatoes, maybe in, in the culture there that it was meat and rice. But for Paul, uh, it, it was extremely, extremely important. Um, you know, even in Galatians 2, he says it another way. Um, let me pull that up. I think that's worth reading. Um, he talks about the truth of the gospel. He says, we did not give in to them a moment so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. And again, Paul's in prison. He's not about to give in. Um, the truth of the gospel, he's got to preserve it. He's got to, to go forth with it. Uh, verse 14, he says, when I saw they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, um, I said to Peter in front of them all, you're a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile, not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? That's getting a little bit out there, but uh, the, the point he's saying is the truth of the gospel is important for people to know. And Paul, Paul's like, I don't, you know, wherever I am, God has made me, he has adopted me as his child, and and I'm going to share him with other people because he wants everyone to be his child. Um, and so that that perspective is, it helps us see that no matter where we are in life, that man, my cup is running over because I am a child of God. Okay, well, Paul says, and notice the verse 13, is, as a result, it has become clear through the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I'm in chains for Christ. And so, you know, that means... Uh, whether I'm inside a jail cell or outside, my chains are for Christ. Yeah, he might rather be free and be able to, to move about, but he's accomplishing the same purpose right there. When he when he says these things right here, um, the whole palace guard, you know, that, that is, uh, we believe in some of the historical research, they would bring the, the, these uh, Roman troops in. It was really kind of the elite Roman troops that were brought in. And that was considered the palace guard there. Um, Paul had access to a lot of things like pen and paper and those kind of things. But these troops, they came in and they were on a four-hour rotation. And, uh, and so Paul had all these different people that he saw it instead of going, man, I am covered up by guards everywhere. I've got all these people I can share the gospel with. And he said, I'm going to exalt Jesus no matter where I am. And so... They constantly, every four hours, they had new people coming in. And they began to know why Paul was there. You know, it, it was uh, for his preaching of the gospel. And so, and, and then those on the outside, the Philippian church he's talking about, you know, uh, it's interesting. Uh, here I am. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to stand up for just a minute. I know I'm on camera. And so you can see there's a chair right here. And what, there's a purpose why I'm saying this. Now, if I sit down in this chair, I have faith that it's going to hold me. I'm not going to go to the floor. I don't even think about it. I just come and I sit down. And Paul has taken that attitude with his faith. I, I see this right here. That without a doubt, he has been ado adopted as his as God's child. And he's he is going to share with other people, regardless of where he is, no matter what, because... To him, to, to live is Christ and to die is gain. We'll, we'll see some more about that in a minute as he actually speaks that in the scripture. But he's good. Either way, he's good. And he's going to exalt God wherever he is. That verse 14 where he says, um, And because of my change, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord. And then and they dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. Uh, what do you, you know what I believe about that? It matters. Just hear that. It matters. His cup running over, seeing that perspective, it matters. It, it is impacting his brothers and sisters in Christ so much that it is emboldening them uh, to lead, it, 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 to step forward and speak fearlessly. They're beginning to bring up this, to take this perspective, not just because it's Paul's example, but they're learning, hey, wait a minute, that Genesis 127 thing, I'm made in the image of God, male and female alike. That we're we're uh, you know uh, God bearers, bearers, and um, and so here we are. You know, they're 
Paul is that example. It's not just because he is an example, but he's because he's a, living the example of what Christ did. And so, yes, it matters. It it uh, stokes other people. They're confident, uh, and and they're ready to go fearlessly. They're living by faith. They're take they're pick, they're taking a chair, and sitting for so to speak. Except they're running and they're sharing with others in the church. That's how the church starts to proliferate. Well, you can see our perspective on life, how important it is that we look at it as my cup runs over. Not that it's half full, not that it's half empty, not that it's a third or a fourth empty or full, it's running over. Uh, to live as Christ, is die, to die as gain. It's a win-win, folks. Let's go to the next section here, verse 15. Uh, we're going to read these next few verses. He says, it is true. It's true that <clears throat> that some preach Christ out of envy and rival, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I'm in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. You know, I titled this next section, <clears throat> The Gates of Hell Will Not Prevail. That comes uh, from Matthew uh, 16, 18, and, and we'll, we'll talk about that in just a minute. But, you know, uh, this first verse we see in, in verse 15 about, it's, he's talking about it. He's just stating a fact that there's people out there preaching Christ, and there, some of them are doing it out of envy and rival, and others out of out of actual goodwill. And so, you know, why why is that important? <clears throat> I mean, Paul. The main thing is we see in here he's talking about that Christ is being preached, even though um, we know we're going to see that 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 stirs up some confusion. Motives can lead to confusion. And, and so they need to be called out. And I believe that's what Paul's doing, first of all. But he's also saying, you know, that's not going to stop it. Uh, we have this temptation of, of the flesh to have our own way. And, and it's always lurking in the shadows. And that's our sin nature. But let me tell you, God will always win. And here, a lot of times some people think he's talking about the Judaizers, those who are Jews who have become Christians, but they're wanting them to convert to the uh, to the law and Judaism as well. And uh, a lot of study done on this section, and they don't believe that's what Paul's talking about. It's just about some of those who have some false motives. And, we, and you know, they're envious of Paul. He's in prison now. And so they're thinking, we can take over with this, this uh, gospel thing. Some people are, are jealous of other people. And, you know, uh, we're all in this together. And you have to ask yourself, are you doing something? Am I doing something because of envy and rival, uh, rivalry or uh, or strife? And, you know, uh, we see that. It's addressed in 1 Timothy 6, 4. He addressed, or goodwill. And there's a whole list of things in Romans 16 that Paul talks about, of all these different people that are doing things for the goodwill of the church uh, and the gospel for Paul and uh, what's happening. And so... Uh, it does. Well, he says, you know, verse 16, the latter do so out of love, knowing that I'm, I'm pure, uh, I'm, I am here for the defense of the gospel. And the former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely supposing they can stir up trouble for me while I'm in chains. And, you know, there's a, a book that I read uh, several years ago, and uh, I'm trying to remember the name of it, but, but it's by a, a deceased author named Jack Frost. Uh, and it's, uh, I think it's uh, something from like spiritual slavery to spiritual life. Uh, I'm not sure that's the right name, but it's close. And, and, and there's a, a chapter in there, and it may be one of his other books, but it, it says, do you want to be right or do you want to have a relationship? And, you know, uh, and this thing, sometimes we want to be right. What I mean by that is we want our perspective to be seen and to be heard and and it may not even be right because of the way we're forcing things in there and our motives. And and Paul's, you know, he, he's wanting you to have a relationship with Christ, first of all, and also to have a relationship with one another as the church. And so um, God's going to win. The gates of hell are not going to prevail. Um, in fact, in the, the last section, I said verse 18, this first part of verse 18, he says, but what does it matter? The important thing is in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. 
they were they were preaching the message of Christ. And you know, again, what I'm saying is what I've said before is is God's going to win, and His wisdom, He's going to carry out His own purposes. Uh, you know that where this came from, the gates of hell will not prevail. Uh, it's uh, a section of Matthew 16, and that comes exactly from verse 18, but it, a few verses before, Jesus is asking the disciples, who do you say I am? And I, I mean, what are people saying I am? And he says, well, some say you're Jeremiah, and some Elijah, and others say you're one of the prophets, uh, John the Baptist. And he says, but who do you say I am? And he says, you're the Messiah, the Christ. And he says, I tell you, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. But, but this has come from God. And, uh, and he says, and I'm telling you, Peter, and he says, on this rock, um, the church will be built. And he says, and even the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And so, you know, when we think about God and his wisdom, he's going to carry out his purposes. Um, you know, and even this part, uh, I, I think, you know, I, I mentioned earlier in the beginning, about this movie uh, or documentary I've been watching uh, with Lee Strobel about the case for heaven. And uh, I want you to see how you can't, here's another example of how a person can even in a, in a death situation, um, hell will not prevail if that person chooses. So he tells about a story about a guy named Howard um, Storm and, uh, and he said about 23% of the people have negative death experiences, as this Lee Strobel's talking about. And so Howard Storm, he was the father of two, married. He was a professor in Kentucky. Um, I even Googled this to, to verify it. And uh, Howard was, uh, he had a, a, he was in France. He was an art uh, professor. And um, he had a, a duodenal uh, rupture in uh, his abdomen and they said if we don't get you to the hospital you, you know you're not going to make it and so he's there and then uh, they couldn't get to the surgery right away and so um, he goes suddenly he tells his wife goodbye and he slips in, away and uh, these are ones that where they have measured people have actually died there's no brain activity there's no heartbeat and he says I can remember all of a sudden um, I was when this happened at first it felt good and I was in this place, uh, you know, that um, I just, like, the pain was gone. He said, but I could see my, this, this body or this lump in the bed, and then I realized it was me. He said, suddenly I heard these voices saying, come with me. You need to come with us. And he's like, oh, okay. And he said, I remember I was in France, and I thought, why are they speaking in English? But they took them, and, and there was these dark light figures and they kept saying, you need to go this way. And he said, I felt like we walked for miles and miles and it kept getting darker, kind of a gray area to begin with. And he said, and eventually they got pretty rough with me. These, these uh, uh, images of these people that were coming with them. And, and so he said, finally they started, you know, I was in this utter darkness. And he said, they are beating me up. And then they start clawing and biting. And he talk about gnashing of teeth and, it was horrible. And he said, I heard this voice that said, pray to God. Pray to God. He said, but I'm not a believer. He said, pray to God. And he said, suddenly I was taken back to this Sunday school class where I was, um, there was, uh, I could hear Jesus loves me. This I know. And it was like, I thought, oh my gosh. Okay. All right, Jesus. I, he says, save me. And suddenly this hand, he says, it was like, and this bright light came. And he said, it was so bright that in, in the natural, I think it, I, I would have died before. And he reaches and puts his hand on my shoulder and I bury my head in his chest, he says. And, and I'm weeping. And, and Jesus is like, it's okay. And he says, and of course he's saved. And he says, and then I come back to life. And he had a, a pretty long recovery. But this... Uh, Howard Storm, he leaves the, the uh, university once he's well, and he becomes a minister. And so we see that even the gates of hell could not prevail. And, and Paul is, is showing that right now in the, in the real time in life. And, uh, and so with the big picture, 
he's, he's got this perspective, you know, he's, uh, that Calvary, what has happened, the resurrection. And so this is just not wishfulness, but it is deep conviction for Paul of having this divine perspective. And what are we to do? Philippians 2 tells us that, that we're to follow Paul's example. Um, and I think that is so important and uh, to have the mindset of Christ and, and to follow his example. Um, as Paul says, I follow Paul's example. He says, as I have followed Christ. It's not about Paul, but it's about him following Christ. The last thing I want you to say as we close up, uh, the rest of verse 18 says this, and yet, notice he says, and because of this I rejoice. <laughs> of course he rejoices that not even the gates of hell will prevail against him. And, uh, and, and he says, and yes, again, I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. He says, so I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or death. You know, happiness is momentarily, but joy is eternal. And so we see here, Paul is talking about these, this truth of him and, and the fact that through the prayers of the people, and, and the infusion of the Spirit of Christ within him that strengthens that that he's going to be delivered, uh, saved, vindicated from from what's going on, no matter what. It means that that in Christ, uh, hope in Christ is is being magnified, and whether it's in life or in death, uh, you know, and struggle in that. In, in his documentary, he's talking about how fear of death drives our lives a lot of times, uh, the culture and, and these underlying fears, it, it, like it drives our ambitions. Uh, he said, he was asking some people the questions, you know, what happens if you never open your eyes? And people are like, I, I don't know. And, and, uh, and, and they're like, this fear of that, they're always trying to find fulfillment maybe in the world, what's going on, or, with, and, you know, Here's the guarantee we have. 2 Corinthians 5, 8 says it this way, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So that's why Paul, again, is doing this. And this third point I just failed to mention is for the glory of God and the good of the people. Everything we do is for the glory of God and for the good of the other people. And that's what Paul is doing right here. Uh, look at these next few verses in verse 21. For to me, he says, to live is Christ and to die is gain. There it is. If I'm to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yeah, what shall I choose? I do not know. I'm torn between the two. I desire to part and, and be with Christ, which is by, uh, by far, it's better by far, but it's more necessary for you that I remain in the body. And, you know, Paul obviously is pondering about death and afterlife and in the, in the present, and, and that helps us accept the reality of what is really happening here. He's saying, I really don't have a choice. I mean, it's, we're not, you know, we're not to take our life, And but he's saying, yes, I'd much rather be with him because that's the ultimate prize. But he says, right now, my focus is Christ. It's always to be here. And, you know, I don't know if you've ever had any um, personal near-death experiences or things where, like, but I can tell you, uh, I had, uh, a situation where this has been back in 2016 and uh, I kept passing out and finally um, I'm talking about like four to five times in just a few hours ended up in an ambulance on the way to the hospital and I passed out and that was the last time I, I did and I can remember in that moment that this gets a little emotional for me I heard the Lord say to me don't worry I'm with you whether you're on earth or whether you're going to come with me in, in heaven. I'm with you. I'm always with you. And I woke up from that, and I had this total peace. Of course, I ended up having to have a pacemaker put in, and I've been fine ever since. But but uh, it was an incredible experience. And the reality was, the Lord's like, don't worry about what's going on around you. You just share others with me. And so the orientation is that we've got this prize. They call it in terms eschatological. That means end times. The end, looking at the end when we, we come and we meet with Christ. But um, otherwise, it's to live as Christ, uh, you know, and, and for now. And so 
But now, remember, it's not to live as Christ plus work, to live as Christ plus leisure, accumulating wealth, relationship. It's to live as Christ, period. These other things are there. That's a part of our, our where we are on earth that we do. But to live as Christ, that is the crust of who we are. And, and the, li the life that we have is to benefit others is what's, what Paul is saying here. Well, what's the result of, the, of being life? Convinced of this, Paul says, I know that I'll remain and I'll continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on the count of me. Man, between life and death, we really don't have a choice when you think about it. But we do have a choice of stepping into life in Christ on this earth. And so today I ask you, will you, Step in it. Will you be the gospel? Will you share the gospel and keep your eyes on the end goal? Will you? You know, you're like, well, you don't know how old I am or how young I am or, or you don't know where I live or, or uh, you know, do I fully understand? It, it, age, status, your intellect, it, it doesn't really matter. Maybe you're afraid. Maybe there's fear. But remember this chair? You pick up the chair of faith. You take and sit down, just like you sit down in that chair that you're in now in your home, wherever you are. Take a step of faith towards the gospel, towards Jesus Christ and becoming a child of him. Um, you know, but you're like, you don't know what I've done. I'm going to tell you what, he doesn't care what you've done. He has already gone to the cross and made your sin clean for you. All you have to say is, Lord, forgive me. He's already done it. But acknowledging your sin before him and saying, I want to follow you for the rest of my life. And, and, and you know, maybe you're one of those who's constantly searching for this deep meaning and trying to find a purpose in life. And it's in Christ. That's where it is. For you got to understand why you're here. It's a win-win to live as Christ. And, and if you're living in Christ, then to die is gained. Pray with me. Lord, we thank you for this day. I thank you for this word. Lord, for Paul, it's hard. And Lord, for him being an example to you. Now, Lord, I pray to those that are hearing this today. Lord, that if you have heard this message, those of you listening online, I ask you, I plead with you. An invitation is being extended to you by Jesus Christ, not by Rick Bowling. I'm just a, a voice and an instrument. But just as Paul has shared with many, Lord, his... The word that he shared is coming it's coming to you right now and so say yes to his invitation say yes I want to live in Christ and so that when I do die there will be gain um, and, and not just for that purpose but for the purpose of leading others as well through your life your example your words that you partner with me and others in the gospel and advancing it we just ask these things in Jesus name amen Hey, if you have accepted that, that challenge today, or that maybe not challenge, but the invitation, uh, and you have now taken that chair of faith that we just talked about, and to say, yes, I'm a Christ follower, and, uh, and, and I want to be a part uh, of the church, then I would love to hear from you. Uh, again, you can contact me, Rick Bowling at wbcshelby.org or a pastor in your local community, or another a trusted friend that's a believer, because we're all a part of the church. And so that as a Christ follower, you can live and, and be nurtured and discipled from this day forward. In Jesus' name, amen.